Where did we leave off? We were talking about, oh, one thing I want to touch on before I forget, FOC. I said it was very overcomplicated and kind of wacky and I don't want to lead you astray. There is a point when adding weight to the front of your arrow may or may not make it shoot better in the wind for you. Okay, so when I said I don't worry about FOC, I don't worry about what the percentage is. If I'm having trouble, I think my arrows are drifting too much, I'll stick a heavier point in that arrow and I'll shoot it and find out if it drifts less and if it does, yeehaw. But I don't go, oh, it's not 15.6%. I don't worry about that part of it. FOC will affect, depending on where you are with your point, a lot of times how that arrow flies in the wind and how it holds its line in the wind. So I don't want you to misunderstand and think that it has no bearing at all on what's going on. But be advised, by changing your FOC, you will also change the dynamic spine of that arrow. Okay? So you will have to do some retuning. If you just slap five more grains of point weight in there, um, or 10 more grains of point weight, and you're especially on an ACE or parallel shaft, it will change the tune of that arrow. You'll see left and right type of stuff. So make sure you retune when you do that. Okay? So it's not a totally useless thing, I just think measuring it doesn't matter. Once you got one, you got one. And if it works, it works. If you do want to measure it after you have an arrow that really does work, check your FOC, and if you ever change shafts, then you might want to start with an FOC similar to the one you had before. Make sense? <coughs> cool. Um, somebody had brought up a question about tiller. Okay, tillering a bow, which always comes up when we talk about setting pockets and stuff on Avalon. Mike and I have two interesting stories about tiller. I will let Mike tell his first, since it's older than mine, and then I'll tell mine. Yeah, mine may be older, but I still have all my hair. That's right. <laughs> and I'm still thin. <laughs> oh! No. Uh, back in about 1975, um, I flew out to uh, St. Louis, Missouri, where we were having a world team trial for the U.S. And that was real close to Earl Hoyt's place. So I went out and I spent a week with him. And we did a lot of testing and dinking around with a lot of different stuff. And towards the end of the week, all the big guns in the U.S. were starting to fly into town. And since Earl's place was pretty close by, they all wanted to stop in and stay, say hi to him. So the first person that showed up was Daryl Pace. Daryl Pace came waltzing into the plant and said, Hi, how are you? And Earl said, Great, you know, we've been playing with stuff all week, and I have a big question to ask you. What do you consider to be the perfect tiller to be? And Daryl said, well, you know, because of my grip and because I like the arrow closer to the center of the bow and I like it down at the bottom and yada, 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 eighth of an inch is exactly where it should be. Earl just pulled out his pen. Great, eighth of an inch. Got it. And he's writing notes and he's writing down what he said. Following day, some more folks were starting to come in and Rick McKinney showed up. Came walking in, and Earl came out and said, Hey, Rick, how you doing? Hey, i got a big question for you. I've been dying to you know, get this, the shooter's perspective on tiller, and I just want to know what you consider to be the perfect tiller. And he said, Well, it's got to be five-eighths of an inch. And I've been meaning to talk to you about that. You know, you just have yours way too close. I always have to adjust mine because back then we didn't have adjustable bows. And the only way to do that was with a piece of sandpaper. And after I do that, my bow looks real ugly. So I, you need to start making it closer to half an inch. Earl's face just kind of fell. And he had this kind of sad look in his eye. And he pulled out his pen and wrote down the notes and said, Gee, thanks. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> And thus began the quest to build the TD-3. The TD-3 was his first project in an adjustable tiller bow. And he did that because he did not want to have to get in that argument anymore. 1985 rolls around. National team camp. Ten years later, we're still having the same argument. Now they're adjustable, but what's the right tiller? Earl Hoyt is at the national team camp. Now, Earl Hoyt has forgotten more about building compounds than any of us, or building recurves, than any of us will ever know. 
And we, the top 10 archers on the U.S. national team, are arguing with the man about Tiller. We're not bright. We can shoot bows. And we're saying Tiller matters. It changes everything. It changes the way the arrows group. Earl said Tiller does not make a difference. Your knocking point will compensate for whatever Tiller you want to shoot. All Tiller does is change how the bow feels in your hand at full draw and how the bow comes out of your hand when you shoot it. That's all it does. Knocking point adjusts for everything else. It don't matter. Well, we beg to differ with you there, buddy. So we're going to go prove this deal. So Rick McKinney took his bow and cranked it to a half an inch negative tiller. Put up a paper plate at 50 meters. We tuned his bow. Went out to 50 meters and he shot a group of 30 arrows in that paper plate. Then he went up a quarter of an inch. And we did it again. And put up a new paper plate. And then he went up another quarter of an inch. And we did it again. And we put up a new paper plate. And he did that from a negative half inch to a positive half inch tiller. We had to move the knocking point twice in that entire move. That's a full inch. Moved the knocking point twice and it was less than an eighth of an inch each time we moved it. The groups never change. I said, how'd your bow feel? I said, felt like crap. <laughs> Earl said, told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tiller only changes how the bow feels in your hand and how it reacts when it comes out of your hand. I know there's a guy in this room that's shooting his tiller dead even. I know another guy in this room is shooting his tiller at three eighths. There's probably somebody in here shooting it closer to a half. Don't get too bound up about it. Wherever it feels right, the bow feels good in your hand, that's where the bow is going to shoot. They've done some testing at, at Hoyt, or did a survey at Hoyt, talked to some shooters, found out the guys that shoot with a little bit higher grip tend to shoot. A straighter wrist grip, folks, tend to be closer to zero. And folks that had a lower wrist grip tended to like it further away from zero. And although that was the results of that one survey we did, it still didn't take into consideration the personal factors of the group we chose. And so we really still considered it to be inconclusive. That's really the closest to any conclusion we've ever been able to come up with. So don't get too bound up about tiller. It's nice to have one. It's good to know where it is so it doesn't change on you. But your knocking point will compensate for it, and if the bow feels good coming out of your hand, handy. Um, sometimes it will affect when you pull the bow, how the bow feels as it comes back. Some tillers will make the bow rise, some will make it fall, depending on how you put your hand in the bow. Makes sense? It works, you don't believe me, I can tell you how to test. It's real easy on these bows, at least for screw the tiller up. Did you turn Mike's mic off? I'm not too much. He's new with microphones. Don't do this to him. Y'all remind him that when he comes back out, we're all going to laugh. Um, somebody else was asking me about uh, limb flutter after the shot. Their limbs flop around a little bit. Um, the key to that is those limbs tend to do that after the shot. The arrow is gone. Bye bye. See ya. Some bows tend to do that depending on the poundage, depending on the brace height you have. Uh, Mike was explaining on the field today that some folks are asking about brace height. Where's the best brace height? Um, with Hoyt bows, we recommend a certain tiller range. <laughs> With brace height, we, at Hoyt, they give you a range of brace height. And the reason there's a range for a particular length bow is that's where the geometry of that bow is best. And by best, we mean that's where the knocking point is the most stable, up and down. If you get your tiller or your um, brace height too far above or below that point, you either have too much bend or not enough bend in your limb. And the brace height will become, or the knocking point will become unstable up and down. Okay? Now, I mean, you can go a little bit outside of the specs, and it's not going to make a ton of difference. 
But if you go very far out, you're going to notice that. What does that affect? Well, that makes it real easy to shoot a higher low arrow. If you're real consistent, you can probably shoot it and be just happy with it. But it's going to make it more likely for you to have high and low groups if you get outside of that brace height range. In that range, you will generally find a place that the bow sounds and feels good. That is generally the best brace height to shoot that bow at. And you can move a little bit from there to accommodate for a tune. If you're just a little bit stiff or a little bit weak, you can move it a little bit from there and typically still have that same sound and that same feel. Uh, the bow's geometry is this curvature in the limbs. And when the brace height is right, these limbs oppose each other in such a way that this knocking point is difficult to move. As you go outside the range, going outside the range a little bit doesn't, doesn't really have large detrimental effects, but the further you move from the range, the more detrimental effects it has. Okay? The same holds true for the poundage adjustment, tiller poundage adjustment. This was initially designed to be a tiller adjustment, but it had so much range in it, it turned into a poundage adjustment. But when you move that limb bolt past the halfway point, you again begin to sacrifice small amounts of vertical stability by putting more load in the limb and more of a curvature in the belly of the limb, which again softens the <coughs> vertical stability. Everybody understand that or have any questions on it? So the best place to get a pair of limbs is that what they're marked. Uh, it's not detrimental in any way to use that adjustment to help your tune. If you've got an arrow that's a little bit too stiff, by all means, throw a turn in it, it's not going to hurt you. But once you get past that halfway point, you again start to sacrifice that vertical stability. One thing about archery, there are no absolutes. So I'm not going to stand here in my and say, you absolutely cannot get the bow to group if you take this tiller adjustment and bury it all the way down and shoot the limbs at the highest possible poundage you can. Because I know guys that shoot them that way and shoot them well. So the whole idea behind tuning a bow is to get the bow as forgiving as possible so when you make a mistake, you pay the smallest price at the target. If you shot every arrow perfect, every bow would be tuned, it wouldn't matter. So the whole point behind tuning a bow, behind setting one up, is trying to find the most forgiving setup you can have. I've had some setups that shot outstanding when I was right on top of them. I mean were incredible. But if I was feeling a little fuzzy, they were ugly. I would rather have a setup that gives me a range of points from whatever score, 1310 to 1300, and do that every time, than to have a bow that, oh, once every two months would shoot a 1340. Because you never know when that one's going to happen. Maybe practice, maybe a tournament. But on the low side, if it's at 1100, that's a pretty good gamble somewhere in there. So I want my bow to be as forgiving as it possibly can and get that range of points that I shoot as narrow as possible from a bad day to a good day. That's when you know you got a forgiving setup. So without trial and error, how do you set up that forgiving? Without trial and error, how do you set up that forgiving bow? You don't. You don't. <laughs> but and if you knew how to do that, you'd probably be making a lot of money. There's at least three or four people that would buy that secret off of you. I can't tell you how I tune my bow, and it's going to distress a lot of you, because it takes oh about a week to two weeks of shooting every day to really get the bow where I know it's going to shoot good, that I'm confident that when I turn loose of the string it's going to go in the direction I pointed it most of the time. Um, how many people here bear shaft tune? When you're bear shaft tuning, perfect. Uh, how many people are paper tuned, compound shooters, paper tuned? Shoot for bullet holes? How many compound shooters bear shaft tune? A few of them? Okay. Um, that was two more than in the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> Bear shaft tuning for a recurve shooter, I think, is the best way to go. That's the good news. Bad news is, when you get your bear shaft hitting in the group, you've only started. You have just gotten to the point where you're fairly sure you're not going to kill the neighbor's dog the next time you shoot. That's what bear shaft tuning is. You guys that shoot bullet hole through paper with a compound, that's where you are. You are close. And it's pretty good, but there's a lot more points to be had if you take it another step. And that step takes a while. Just to real quickly go over bear shaft tuning, 
take three fledged arrows and two bear shafts. Two. Reason being, when you're launching bear shafts, you don't have to make much of a mistake to get those bear shafts oh, about this far apart. And if you group somewhere in the middle, is that one stiff or is that one weak? Okay, you want to have your bear shafts hitting at least on the same side of the group before you have a conclusion of what the bow is doing. So you shoot at whatever distance you're comfortable with, depending on the skill of the archer. It may be 12 meters or it may be 30 meters. I personally don't believe in shooting a bear shaft past 30 other than just because it's cool. Past 30 meters, I tend to get false readings on what the shaft is doing. If I go to 50 meters, I can have a bow that tunes stiff at 30, will tune weak at 50 because the arrow comes out and does that. So at 30 meters, it's hitting where the bow pushed it, but at 50 meters, it's working its way back, and it'll end up on the other side of the group. So, whatever distance you choose, go out there and launch those three fletch arrows down there for a group. Now, that's considering you have already set up your Avalon properly, you have made your best guess on knocking point, you have set your center shot, I set mine, line of the string up down the back, just on the outside of the string, at the tip of the arrow, so that the shaft touches the edge of the string. The reason I do that is with fingers, when you let go of the string, if you're right-handed, the string jumps to the left. Well, when it jumps over there, it's now behind the arrow instead of to the side of the arrow. With the compound, you generally set them up right down the string. When you dump a release, the string goes straight down the back of the bow. So, Shoot your three fletched arrows for a group. Now, if a group is this for you, great. Shoot a group. If this is a group for you, fine. Shoot a group. Don't stand there all day if you shoot groups like this and try to shoot groups like that. Because by the time you do it, it'll be time to go home. So shoot your normal group. Then shoot your two bear shafts. If they hit below the group, your knocking point is too high. Hit above the group, knocking point is too low. A bear shaft will go the direction it was last shoved by the bow. That's the whole point of shooting the bear shaft. If it goes, I gotta think backwards here. If it goes to the left of the group, it is too for right-handed archer. If it goes to the right of the group, it is too weak. Okay. So if it goes High and left of the group for right-handed archer, it is too stiff and the knocking point is too low. So now you have two things to adjust. Only adjust one at a time and always adjust your knocking point first. Because a lot of times when moving your knocking point, you will change the stiffness of that arrow without ever having to move the button or stiffen or weaken the button. So once you get the knocking point level with the group, then you can start working on your cushion plunger, tighter or weaker, depending on which way you have to go. If as you're moving your cushion plunger, you notice that the bear shaft and the group of fleshed arrows never get any closer together, they just move across the target face, you've got the wrong spined arrow, either too weak or too stiff. Okay, there's a couple things you can do. If it's too stiff, for most arrows, you can add point weight, that'll weaken it up. You can add weight to your bow, you can take strands off of your string. You can also change your brace height. Here's a tricky one. And I know I'm going to get an argument out of this, but you're going to have to take my word for it. I can prove it to you. Which way do you move your brace height if you want to weaken the arrow? Higher. Thank you. You move it up. That actually increases the weight of the bow, makes the arrow dynamically weaker. Sounds backwards because you shorten your power stroke. And you have There's a lot of stuff in writing out there that says the contrary. But the fact is, lower brace height has less of an immediate load on the back of the arrow, makes it stiffer. Higher brace height, more load, weaker. Cool, you got that one. I'm proud of you all. <laughs> okay, so you get your bear shafts hitting with your fledged arrows. Life's good, I'm tuned, eh, <clears throat> wrong answer. Now if you really want to tune that bow, you got about a week ahead of it. What you do is you go down the quicks and you get one of those little books that's got those little target faces drawn in them. Those neat little leather ones that hang on the side of your quiver, those are ideal. You take one of those target faces and you go out to whatever distance you like to shoot. 50 meters, 70 meters, 90 meters, 100 yards, York ground, I don't care, whatever it is. You start launching arrows at a target face and you plot a gr your groups. 
on one target, on one of these little target faces. You shoot at least 30 arrows, and you plot them all in that target face. Now above that target face, you measure your knocking point, and you write the measurement down. And on your cushion plunger, since we're, that's the first face we've shot, we're going to call the setting on the cushion plunger zero. So you write down zero. You shoot those 30 arrows, and you plot them all in that one little face. And you look and see what your groups are doing after you've shot those 30 arrows. If the groups are running up and down, but are not very wide, you have a little bit of a knocking point problem. If the groups are running horizontal, sorry, vertical, horizontal, I had it right, horizontal, and not very tall, that is a cushion plunger tension adjustment. If they're doing both, that is, you need to adjust both, but you're going to adjust the okay, boy. first. Thank you. So, whatever you have to adjust, you go to the next little target down on the page and you write, say if you had to move your knocking point, uh, oh, and which way do you move it? That's a good guess. You don't really know. I would suggest always moving your knocking point up first and tightening your plunger first. Moving it up, I'm talking little movements, like small. We're micro-tuning here. Millimeter, two millimeters, max. Nobody has asked why yet. <laughs> Why? Because most uh, compound and reaper marchers find that they get their very best groups. And we'll show you why in just a second. So, you go to the next little target. Now, you've already shot 30 arrows today, so you're feeling pretty good about yourself. For me, that's a full day lately. 30 arrows, I'm done. That's why it takes a week sometimes. So, you go back to your, your number two target, and you write down that you move your knocking point up. And you write what the new measurement is, because you've changed it. Okay, you haven't changed your button, so that's still zero. You shoot another group of 30 arrows, and you plot them all on that target. If the group got better, you're going the right way. If it got worse, you're going the wrong way. Pretty simple. So if it got better, let's say we got rid of our knocking point problem, but we still got a little horizontal thing happening there. So we're going to change now our cushion plunger tension. So we go to a third target. Now you're 60 arrows into the day. And you write down your knocking point, and you're going to put one quarter turn plus on your button. So you're one quarter turn tighter than you were before. And you do it again. And you keep doing this, and you'll notice your groups get better and better and better and better, and then they get worse and worse and worse. Well, the first time they get worse, you went too far. Stop. Now you can go back and look at that pad, and look at your groups, and find out what settings on your bow it grouped the best and you can set it back to that. Then, go back to the distance you originally started your bear shaft tune, shoot your three fledged arrows, shoot your two bear shafts, and I'll be willing to bet most of the people in this room, their bear shaft will be slightly below the group, and if you're right handed, slightly to the left of the group. A little knock high, and a little stiff. Because that way, as the arrow leaves the bow, it's lifting up and away as it goes past the bow. Gives you better clearance. Does that make sense? Better clearance is a good thing. That way when you really pooch a shot, it still goes by the riser without whacking it. If you shoot a clean shot, it goes by the riser without whacking it. We're looking for forgiving. And by doing this, and it takes a while, you will find where that bow shoots the best. If you want to go even one step further, you can start playing around with your brace height a little bit. But remember, every time you change your brace height, you might have to retune it. And lower left, again, at 8 o'clock was for right-handed. Left-handed, 5 o'clock. How far out of the group? Generally, it's an inch or so below the group and an inch or so on the stiff side. Generally. At, for me, I shoot it at 30. Some people do it at 20, some people do it at 15. If you really don't know where your bear shaft's going to go, I would suggest going up fairly close. Because I did have a setup one day that at 30 meters I launched my bear shaft and it never got to the target. It took a hard right turn at about 20 meters and went. And I found it days later. Luckily, there was just nothing but trees over there. So, I mean, if you're worried about where, you know, if you haven't done it before, you might want to start fairly close and see where it's going. But you have to be far enough back that that arrow does start to tail the direction it was pushed by the bow. Uh, can you repeat that book for a compound? For a compound, with a bear shaft? 
It's exactly the same thing. For, for a paper tune, you start out, you get your bullet hole, adjusting your knocking point, adjusting your center shot with a compound. Now, in the books, you got these cool little books that show you these little tear marks and tell you which way to move your arrow rest or which way to move your knocking point. With many, many, many times, you will move it the direction that little book tells you and it will get worse. Don't panic. Move it the other way. Because what's probably happening if you're getting a knock high tear and you move your knocking point down and it gets worse, what's happening is your arrow's probably hitting your arrow rest and kicking up. So you move it down, now it hits it even harder and kicks even higher. Don't freak out. Just go the other direction. That happens quite a bit with compounds. Or quite if you move it launcher rests. What's that? Quite a bit with launcher style rests. Since they're the most popular these days. If you're moving it left and right, gesundheit. If you're moving it left and right and it goes the opposite of what it says in the book, just move it the other way. Now, if you cannot get rid of a left and right tear, I will be willing to bet you have too much torque in your bow hand. I have watched guys in the United States go through a 100 meter roll of paper and make confetti and have not had a bullet hole. I mean have slapped more of this. They've been there from the time the shop opened to the time they kicked them out, have not got a bullet hole yet. The guy that owns the shop finally gets disgusted and walks back there and grabs their bow and picks it up and goes, boom, bullet hole, bye out of here. <laughs> bow hand. On a compound, your bow hand is critical. You have no weight at full drop. I'm holding 48 and a half pounds at full drop. I am not big enough to tweak my bow hand very far. But when you're only holding 20 at full draw, you can do all sorts of neat things in front of that bow. You can make your stabilizer move about that far. You can knock your arrow off the rest of your cables if you really want to. It doesn't take much on the compound, and you'll get a left and right. What's that? I need to lift up with a knife with your finger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do knock it off, just pick it up with your finger and set it back up. There. So your bow hand is critical to get to get a decent paper tune. It's got to be consistent. Got to be. So once you get your bullet hole going, then you do the same thing. You go back to a distance you're comfortable with, and you shoot for groups. And if they're this way, then you make side to side adjustments, and we're talking small adjustments at this point, you're not moving it feet and miles, you're moving it millimeters. If the knocking point, you know, if it's this way, you tweak your knocking point a little bit. Then you go back and you shoot it through paper, and nine out of ten people will find their tear is slightly, knock high, slightly left. For a right-handed shooter. Right shooter. Um, I'm a firm believer in technique. Most people can pick up a whole lot more points if they execute the shot correctly. Um, I have seen worldwide and given many, many, many seminars, and I've had people ask me questions about things that never even crossed my mind as an archer. I mean, like, whoa! You stay up way too late watching infomercials thinking about this stuff. And that's okay. But too many people get so caught up in the nuts and bolts of every little thing's got to be perfect. I mean, there's guys in the States that will measure every single thing on their bow. I had a guy come up and go, my sight pin doesn't line up over the top of my arrow. And, well, it just doesn't line up over the top of my arrow. Something's wrong. And, well, where's yours? I don't know. I can't see them both at the same time. <laughs> when I'm aiming, I'm looking through my sight pin at the target. I don't care where my arrow is if when I let go it hits where my sight was. I don't care if they get their knock first if they're in a group. Doesn't matter. Now, I mean, if it was this far outside my, you know, my arrow, yeah, there's probably a problem. I put my arrow on there and I looked for the guy and I went, it's outside my arrow. Why? Because that's where it hits the target. I don't know. I don't care. It groups. It hits the target. It goes twang. I have fun. I win. Let me go home. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. Don't get too wound up about it. I have shot the same basic setup on my bow since 1986. I shoot a V-bar that goes out about this far and tips down about that far. 
I shoot five inch extension, I shoot 24 inch main rod. That ain't changed. I got friends that every time they show up for tournament got a different stabilizer set up. Every time. God love you, you keep us in business. And I'm sorry Tom, I'm gonna tell them the truth man, you don't have to have every single one of them. Find one that works and stick with it, work on yourself. My bow has never lost me an archery tournament. I have lost a bunch. A bunch. You work on yourself more than your equipment. It's great to be able to tune it. It's great to be able to set the string on the back of the riser. It's great to know why things happen. But if that is your main concern, you're missing the whole point. We started this whole silly game because it was really cool to stand there and launch an arrow, watch it fly through the air, and hit where we aimed it. How much cooler does it get? I still get a thrill every time I turn loose of an arrow at 90 meters and it hits the goal. That is the coolest thing. I'll tell you a story about equipment. Daryl Pace set the world record with aluminum arrows, a TD2 takedown bow, a Kevlar string. Uh, Rick McKinney also set the world record the same day. Rick held the world record for two and a half minutes. <laughs> Because he finished on the A on the B line and Daryl finished on the A line. Rick had a 1329, 1329, beat the world record by many points. Daryl Pace had a 1341. Baby. World record stood for ages. Three days after that tournament, Rick and Daryl were sitting in a hotel room and Rick was very at that time fastidious about his equipment. And he had his plunger completely taken apart and was cleaning the inside of it with a Q tip. Daryl looked at him and said, what the hell are you doing, boy? Daryl's from Ohio, you know. <laughs> and uh, Rick said, well, I'm making sure this is all clean because it rained a couple days ago while we were shooting and I want to make sure there's no moisture in there. And Rick goes, really? He goes, oh yeah, that's very important. Daryl went and unscrewed his button out of his bow, loosened the thing, took the back off and dumped rusty water <laughs> out of his plunger. This is three days after he set the world record. If you're shooting good, it doesn't matter. I will tell you another story about an archer who's fairly decent. Uh, 1988, won the world, or excuse me, won the national field championships in the U.S. They were right before the national target. Um, this guy's left-handed, going ball, <laughs> still skinny, fairly thin, shooting the national field, won it resoundingly by 30-something points. The next day was the practice day for the National Target Championships and this guy was shooting 90 meters and sometimes the clicker went off really fast and sometimes it didn't go off so quick. And the arrows were kind of high and low at the target there at 90 meters, but not terrible. I mean, you know, top of the gold, bottom of the gold, occasional eight here and there. Not terrible, but not quite as good as he thought he was shooting. And uh, he was messing with some equipment and his girlfriend at that time happened to be going to the target and I said, would you grab those for me? And she came back and as she's walking back, she's looking at the arrow saying, how long have you been shooting these? Looking at my points. I shot them, these six here, I shot, you know, four of them for the world field, or national field. Really? You know you're shooting two different weight points? <laughs> True story. I had been messing with my ACE points, and I had some 39s and some 36s. That makes about that much difference in length. So the only thing I can assume is during the field, the short ones are the ones I shot uphill. <laughs> the long ones are the ones I shot down. But they were all mixed together in my quiver. And I didn't notice it until I'm on flat ground shooting 90 meters. I still won the national field going away, shooting two different point weights. Would have probably shot them during the FIDA and not been too concerned because they still weren't that bad at 90 meters. I also took second place at the World Indoor Championships in 91. From my heaviest to my lightest arrow that I shot indoors, seven grains difference in weight. Of course, the arrow I was shooting was a 2413 with a 280 grain point. No, that's not a typo, folks. 280 grains. Heavy on the F for the <laughs> FOC. Yeah, a lot of F on that one. <laughs> a lot of front. Um, seven grains difference. 18 meters, arrow that heavy. It didn't matter. Now, at 90 meters on an ACE, seven grains is a ton. You're going to notice that. 
But what I'm trying to tell you about those stories is don't get too bound up about everything being perfect. Rick McKinney won the world championships with a riser that was more bent than the one I won the Olympic Games with. I mean, his was so bad, people would walk by it when it was propped up while he was at the target, and I watched him do this. They'd walk by and they'd casually stop and go, and start lining up a string, and they'd go, oh my God, they're going to walk <laughs> off. Like, they were scared to even tell him how bad it was. Doesn't matter. Give yourself every advantage you can. Absolutely. But it's the shooter that shoots the arrow. It'll always be that way. We have all this cool new stuff. Cool machine risers, neat lint materials, X10 arrows, and my best score still is 1977 with aluminum and glass lamps. So I'm that still was a 1327. My best feat in a tournament is with the old AC arrow and wood carbon limbs and a fast, no, I'm sorry, a Kevlar string. 1342 in 1986. I have shot higher in practice since then, but I've never shot higher in a tournament than that. So, a variety of things will work. Again, you set up the bow to be as forgiving as you can possibly have it. But every day I would shoot around 300 arrows, unless I was traveling to a tournament or shooting a tournament. And the reason I shot that many was at 1276, I needed to be at 1320 something to have a shot at one of the Olympic Games. Once I got there, I was able to maintain that between 88 and 92, shooting a lot less arrows. And I was fifth in 92 and lost a one arrow shoot off to some limey guy, I can't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> um, who went on to win the bronze medal? I did that. But uh, I, I didn't have to shoot near as many arrows once I got to that level. Once I got there. But to get there, I had to work on the confidence, I had to work on the strength, I had to work on the mental toughness. I did a lot of mental training. A lot of mental training. And that can help you no matter what level you are. Pretty neat stuff. You gonna say something, boss? I was gonna say that I pictured during that time you were shooting three to six hundred arrows a day, you were probably a stockholder in Advil. Uh, no, actually I wasn't because I built up to it slowly. Um, and once I got to that point where I was shooting three hundred arrows a day, I knew that if I could shoot 300 arrows in a day, that we hardly ever shoot one day feet as in the States, I wish we did, but we don't hardly ever do it, that a 72 arrow a day was like a walk in the park. I also got so physically strong that I could overpower my bow anytime I wanted to. I was still shooting 48 and a half pounds in, shooting it today, today it overpowers me. Then, at any time during a shot, if that shot hadn't gone off and when I thought it should have, I could make that arrow, make that clicker go off, but I could do it and still execute a good shot. That is the coolest feeling you'll ever have. To be standing there knowing I've held too long and you just and still shoot it in the middle. That's how in shape I was at that time. Um, by shooting that many arrows too, it builds confidence. Even if you shot 300 arrows a day and did it totally wrong, you're going to get consistent. And consistency is where it's at. If you can do it the same way every time, you can tune everything else out of the boat. That's why when Mike goes to the national team camp, the coaches descend upon him like a herd of locusts. He's not what you would call a classical form archer. His elbow is fairly low, it's out a little bit. His release sitting real zippy down the back like Daryl Pace's is, but the man can shoot 1,300. Because he does it the same way every time. He's also strong as an ox. I, on the other hand, am not. I need to be a little more technically proficient in what I'm doing. I was just going to say, I have varying degrees of ways I want to get through the clicker. If I don't get through on the right side, I can use the left. I can just push from the middle. <laughs> So, I'm not saying you have to go out and shoot 300 arrows a day, or you even want to. One thing you have to do is be honest with yourself about where you want to take archery. In 1985, I decided I wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist. And I was going to do everything it took to give myself the best opportunity to do that. I quit my job, 
I dropped out of school 13 hours short of my degree. I found a guy to give me an apartment at half price. I drove a 1968 Carmen Ghia that the wheels were about to fall off of. Um, I worked part-time for my coach to make enough money to live. Six months before the Olympic trials, my phone was shut off because I couldn't pay the bill. When I could pay it, I'd pay the phone bill one month and skip the electric bill. And right before they shut my electricity off, I'd pay what was past due on it. And then before they shut the phone off, I'd pay what was, you know, and I just kind of kept that whole thing going. They financed me unknowingly. Um, I was going to do whatever it took to get to where I wanted to go. And everybody said, man, just think of all the sacrifices you made. I'll have a theory on that. Life is not a matter of sacrificing, it's a matter of choice. That's what I chose to do, therefore I feel like I sacrificed nothing because that's where I wanted to be. If you make a choice and then feel like you're missing out on something over here, odds are you didn't make the right choice. You need to be over here so you don't feel like you're missing out on something. I have now chosen to work on my house and have a career, and I'm not shooting as much archery, and I'm not shooting near as well, but for right now I can live with that because I've chosen to take this path over here. I'm not happy with it sometimes. I, you know, I don't like going to tournaments knowing I'm not shooting well enough to win, but that's the choice I made. So as an archer, if you're aspiring to be your league champion, or your county champion, or your state champion, or your national champion, whatever level you want to be, that's the level you need to train at. So, I mean, if you're only interested in doing it for fun and you want to go out there and rip some arrows off and have a good time, drink a pipe when you're done, don't get real bound up about it. But don't expect to go to a tournament and shoot 1,300. Be honest with yourself, first off. And that's going to take all the pressure off. Then you're going to have fun. That's the whole reason we started this. Right back to flinging arrows, 90 meters or 70 meters, or however far you want to fling them, watching it fly through the air and hit where you aim it. That's the whole reason we started this. As far as mental training goes, um, I get asked about that a lot, and I do, did, am, doing some mental training. Um, I didn't say for the next half hour I'm going to sit down and mental train, because when I do that after about five minutes, I'm sawing logs. It was really difficult for me to sit down and concentrate on just mental training for more than about five or ten minutes. As you do it, you get better at it, but I chose to do it all the time. All I did was shoot archery for three years. Everything I did was archery. My job was archery. I worked part-time for Dick Tone, who's my coach, who owns Cavalier Equipment. All those Olympian arrow rests he shot from 1985 to 1988, I built. I sat in my house and put those little wires and those little back things for hours. Allison's laughing because she used to work there too. <laughs> Didn't you, Allison? Yes, you still got sore thumbs from it, don't you? I built all the plungers. I assembled them all. That's what I did, and I got paid piecework for it, and I got so fast at it I could make about 10 bucks an hour doing it. So at night when I was done training, I'd turn on the TV and sit down and do that for a couple hours and make enough money to buy lunch the next day. Okay? That's how I survived. So everything I did was archery. If I wadded up a piece of paper and threw it in a garbage can, that was an arrow going in the tin ring. Swear to God. If I'm driving down the road, I'm sitting at a stoplight, I shoot two or three arrows real quick in my head. See myself shooting them, see them going in the middle. When I'm out on the range shooting, I wasn't just standing there shooting arrows, I was shooting the last three arrows at the Olympic Games, or I was shooting the last three arrows at the Olympic Trials, or I was shooting the last three arrows against this guy, or I was shooting these three arrows for this, or if a buddy was on the field, we were constantly competing for something. And it doesn't have to be money, it doesn't have to be beers, it doesn't have to be lunch. It may be who has to go get the arrows the next end. It may be who has to go start the car and get the air conditioning cold before I'm going to get in it in Arizona. It may be you better come pick me up tomorrow morning before we go shoot, drive your car. Whatever, anything you can do to be competing. And then while you're competing, in your mind, it's not just with your buddy, it's with Vladimir Eshev or it's with whoever you want to make it. Rick McKinney, Daryl Pace, Simon Fairweather, whoever. Okay, that's mental training. If you've ever daydreamed about shooting a bow and arrow, you've done mental training. That's all it is. Okay, positive affirmations, the cards. I don't know if you've ever heard me talk about those. Three by five cards, I've got them in my uh, day timer there. Write on them things you're working on, things you want to improve on. 
Write it in your own handwriting. Don't type it. It's more powerful than writing your own handwriting. Always positive. I enjoy and am comfortable shooting strong shots in the wind. I enjoy and am comfortable shooting scores over fill in the blank at 90 meters, at 70, at 50, at 30. I enjoy and am comfortable shooting FIDA scores over. I enjoy and am comfortable beating Rick McKinney and Daryl Pace. That was my favorite card. <laughs> Um, I enjoy the comfortable being the Olympic champion. The cool thing about your mind, it does not know the difference between thinking about something and physically doing something. It doesn't know the difference. So every time you read that card and you say, I enjoy and I'm comfortable shooting this score, and you quickly visualize your scorecard or shooting arrows and seeing that scorecard, your mind thinks it just did it. It doesn't know the difference. Now this is a really cool and powerful thing. Unfortunately, the drawback is, as archers, we tend not to think about the good stuff. We tend to focus on the bad stuff. Another little story about Rick McKinney. 1982, at the uh, Olympic Festival Trials in Arizona, he shot the world record at 50 meters, 345. As soon as the tournament was over, we had just made the Olympic Festival team for the Western region of the United States, toughest region at that time still is, to make the Olympic Festival team, top six guys in that region. We're sitting down, we're having a team meeting, and Rick's sitting right beside me. Just set the world record at 50 meters. 345. That is strong at 50 meters. Shooting aluminum arrows. That's 1982. He looks over at me with the scorecard and goes, I shot two eights right there, can you believe it? <laughs> Do you know how many eights I shot at 30 meters? He had just set the world record. I shot two eights right there. Two ends in a row, can you believe that? Eight, eight, right there, eight, eight, eight. Didn't worry about all those one zeros on the scorecard. Shot two eights, that's all he could think about. Well, the cool thing about your mind is it doesn't know the difference between doing it and thinking about it. The bad part of your mind is it doesn't know the difference between doing it and thinking about it. Because every time you shoot a bad arrow, your mind did it one time. Every time you tell your buddy about it coming back from the target, your mind just did it again as far as it's concerned. Every time you live that story to your wife or your boyfriend when you get home, you just did it again. Every time you tell your coach about that bad arrow, you just did it again. Two months later when you're still talking about that arrow you shot, You've done it probably 60 times now. The mind works in pictures. Whatever you picture, your mind will move you toward that thing. Here's a little test for it. I want all of you to absolutely, under no circumstances, do not think about a blizzard. Anybody think about Palm Beach? Oh, what did you see? A bit of snow. <laughs> Your mind never hears the word don't. It only pictures what happened, what, what your visual, what comes into your mind. You think in pictures. If I didn't want to think about a snowstorm, what I should have said was, think about the beach. Boom, there you are in a lounge chair, sipping cocktails, dangling in the water. Okay? It's got to be positive. Don't waste your time talking about the bad stuff. Guilty is charged. Do it all the time. Terrible habit to get into, and that's all it is is a habit. You need to talk about the positive stuff. Because that's what your mind is going to latch on to. And it works. Before 88, I surrounded myself with people that were excited about what they were doing. They were all training for the Olympic team. We were all shooting together. Um, I shot alone quite a bit because I shot for so long, but I was around people that were, for the most part, positive. My coach was positive, people were positive, you can do this. Hey, Rod, go get them. Guess what? After a while, I really believed it. In 1985, if you'd asked me if I thought I was going to make the Olympic team and win the gold medal, I'd have laughed hysterically. I had never made an international team in 1985. 1276 or 1279 was the highest speed I'd ever shot in my life. I had been back shooting for five years in 1985. 
I would not have even imagined making the Olympic team. If you'd have asked me in 1987 if I was going to make the Olympic team, not only would I have said, hell yes, the next words out of my mouth would have been, and I'll win the gold medal. That's how much I believed it. Now, everybody says, wow, that's pretty cocky. You bet your butt it is. You show me one person that is the best in the world at what they do, and tell me they're not about that much cocky. Because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to buy it either. You have got to believe you can do it, or there is no way it's going to happen. Gee, I don't think I can win this tournament. <laughs> I can cross you off my list. <laughs> don't have to be arrogant about it, but you got to be a little cocky about it. you got to be. Even if it's just internally to yourself. I mean, I used to love showing up to tournaments. Come walking in and watch all the guys go, oh, God. I just love that. <laughs> now I'm the London guy, and Justin walks in, I go, oh, God. <laughs> okay, where's he going to end up? Number one. What slot doesn't go against number one? <laughs> okay. That's cool. But again, you can do this at whatever level you want. If you're just doing it recreationally and you want to improve, then work on just improving what you did from last week. <laughs> But when you go to a tournament, realize what level you're at, how much time you're able to put into it, and don't try to match yourself up against this guy sitting right here who's been on an Olympic team. It's not going to happen. He's out there busting a hump, shooting a bunch of arrows, doing the training. You know, he's on the squad, he's doing all the right stuff. You're working for a living, you got 14 kids to support. Well, I'm from Utah now, everybody's got 14 kids. Um, You've got a, a house, a family, you've chosen to do other things. You get to practice an hour every other day if you're lucky. Don't expect to go out there and blow his socks off. It could happen with the new round, but don't bank on it. Odds are not in your favor, so don't get upset when it doesn't happen. That's been one of the hardest lessons for me to learn now that I have chosen to do some other things for a while and not concentrate on archery is going to the tournament knowing then my odds of winning are fairly slim. So now I take great pleasure in being the loose cannon in the new Olympic ground. I'm one of those guys that on any given 12 arrows can knock the crap out of you, but don't bet on me. Makes the young guys really nervous. <laughs> you see that kind of psycho thing in your eye when you go to the line. Yes, sir? Would I say that the new Olympic ground is not a true reflection of the best archer? Um, I would say the new Olympic ground has done what it's supposed to do, which is make archery extremely exciting for the spectator. And I would say define the best archer. The guy that wins when it matters. For that round, that's the best archer. You may catch some luck, and the number one guy who's supposed to be in your bracket gets knocked out by somebody else because he had a bad day or whatever. Or you may never have to shoot against the three guys from Korea because of the way the brackets came out and somebody else took them all out for you. Or you may just get lucky and shoot your best in the, your best 12 arrows of your life when you're against the guy that's really ranked number one and nine times out of ten is going to stomp you. But guess what? For that day, you're the man. And that's part of the excitement about that round. I, the problem we have as archers, we want to relate everything back to the double feet up. When they shot the grand feet, it's in the same thing. Do you really think you're the best archer? Because if you add up your scores, you didn't win the double feet up. Guess what? I wasn't shooting the double feet up. I was shooting the grand feet up. When it was all over with, I had a 338. He had a 336. That makes me the winner. If it had been a double feet up, I'd have thought about it completely differently. I'd have been trying to shoot higher in the earlier rounds instead of just getting by. So I might have won the double feet. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to keep archery in the Olympics, if we have to shoot one arrow at 150 yards at a dime to decide the winner, great, sign me up, I'm there. If it keeps archery in the Olympic Games. It's a different round, and we can't compare it back to the double feet. You just, you can't do it. It's a totally different ball game. We've taken a bunch of marathon runners and turned them into sprinters. Who's the best race? I mean, who's the best runner out there? The guy that can run 100 meters and whatever it is they run it in under nine seconds, or a guy that can run 26 miles in under two hours. Well, it depends on how far you want to go, I guess. That's my answer. Yeah, I think it does what it's supposed to do, and yeah, I think it's a 
I won't say fair round, but I think it's an exciting round. Is it fair that I could have the second highest score in the field and get eliminated? No, that's kind of a bummer. But the guy that had the first highest score was the guy I was shooting against. He goes on, I sit down. Because I wasn't shooting against the rest of the field, I was shooting against him. So it's a different, definitely a different mindset. Absolutely. And you can even take it one step further was, a long time ago when archery really mattered, it was a one-shot competition. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call sudden death. <laughs> you know, so did that choose the best archer? Well, yeah, for that one shot, it sure did. So don't try to compare rounds. Take them for what they are, which is individual, you know, different type of events. And then you'll have a lot less grief in your life. Because if you constantly compare scores and stuff, it'll drive you nuts. That's Jamie's theory on the new Olympic round. Would I rather be shooting grand feeders? You bet! I was good at them. <laughs> I didn't lose a whole lot of grand feeders. For some reason, I could just shoot that round and I loved it. How am I doing the new Olympic round? Struggling. But it's fun, man. There's nothing more exciting than going head to head with somebody. Man, that's cool. Pierre was talking about that today. It's a blast. You get up there and you're nervous and you're wound up and you're flinging arrows and you're having a good time and dang, I lost. My day's over. God, I want to do this again. <laughs> that was fun. I just hate having to wait till the next tournament to get to do it again. And you want to just grab somebody else that lost and go, let's go over here to the practice spells and duke it out. Because it's cool. I mean, it is a lot of fun. Y'all hear that? There's a half hour to the bar closes. You make the choice. Any more questions? <laughs> We'll stay here all night and answer them for you. Yes, sir. Should you trade your Radiant in for an Avalon? Will you buy it from Quicks? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do, you, do you like the way the uh, Radiant shoots? Do you shoot well with it? Sometimes. The Avalon is dramatically different and it's much softer. Uh, so shoot one is what I say. You might want to go give it a try. They're kind of like shoes. You got to try them on, you know. But um, some people like the feel of the Avalon. I talked to a gentleman up here at the break who tried the Avalon Plus from the second version of the Avalon and didn't like it. It felt too soft, so he went to an Elon, and he likes it a lot better. So it's. Personal preference. Unfortunately, I wish archery was more like buying a suit where you went in and you got measured and you're 38 regular and here's what you need. Ain't that way. It's, you know, you can give all the advice in the world, you can tell people how to do things, but when it comes down to it, you got to do what works for you. What works for Mike Gerard will not work for Jay Bars. What works for Jay Bars doesn't work for Daryl Pace. What works for Daryl Pace won't work for you. That's just the way archery is. That's one of the great things about our sport. We have all these options. It's not like golf, you know, where you have one way of doing it. We have a, a whole bunch of different ways to, to go out and enjoy the multi-level challenges that archery has to provide. And that's my favorite thing about this sport. Is there's a bazillion different ways to do it, but I contend that we all go out there for the same reason. We all go out there for the recreation of it, for the fun of it, for the challenge of it. And I know for me there's just nothing like the feeling of standing there on the line, little breeze blowing, flags kind of flapping. Guy blows the whistle. You got that first shot of the morning, and your heart's going boom, 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 boom. boom. You come off the string with a great shot. Boy, you just kind of feel like going back and having a smoke. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> And then the good part is, well, I mean, you get to do it 144 times. <laughs> the stiffness categories in the risers are made strictly for personal performance. I mean, preference. Personal preference is the reason why we have three different stiffnesses. The stiff riser feels very crisp and clean. Makes you feel like it has more performance, but through a chronograph, it's unfortunately the same. Uh, the, the riser with more flex has a very soft feel to the shot. I shot 48 and a half pounds with my GM, and it was the old style GM, the real thin one, the original. The noodle. The noodle. <laughs> shot 48 and a half pounds in, I shoot 48 and a half pounds with an Avalon. They both shoot arrows in the middle. Can you make something? Sir. You made a reference to 
between abalones and shoes? Should we be selling abalones in pairs? <laughs> I know, I prefer mine that way. I know my boss would love for me to go back and tell him that that's what we told everybody. <laughs> I think we might be about done here if uh, I have just a couple of things to say on this occasion. Well, get up on stage, big fella. Okay. <laughs> They're really just thank yous. First of all, thank you for being a, a quality audience. Um, I'm really pleased to see that uh, there's such a good representative um, number of shooters here who perhaps can, if it's stuff they've heard before, at least it's reinforcing it, but perhaps like for the rest of us, it's going to inspire people to go out and try a few things. And one of the reasons that I like Quicks to try and put on these occasions is, yes, we like to sell you stuff, but I also am looking to try and get um, more UK archers to be shooting alongside these guys and beating them. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. That's the first thing. Secondly, thank you for uh, Paul for the sound engineering. Um, Thank you also to Bournemouth Archers for providing the venue. Thank you Leslie and his team for setting up the event for me. And, and probably most of all, thank you Jay and Mike for a great evening. It was our pleasure. If anybody would like to buy me a beer, we can discuss it right over here. <laughs> Real quickly, we would also like to thank Quicks Archery for making this possible for all of us. Because they did all the work to put this together. We just said we'd like to come and do it. And so I'd like to offer my special thanks to them for doing it, putting all the hard work into this. We just got the easy part to come and talk with you all. Here, here.